One of my favorite devotional writers, probably is known for his books on prayer, is a man named E.M. Bounds. E.M. Bounds wrote these words. He said, to talking to men about God is a good thing, but talking to God for men is a great thing. Talking to men about God is a good thing, but talking to God for men is a great thing. He's contrasting evangelism and intercession and really putting them together, but showing us how important it is to pray for people. And in our series, Because You Prayed, as we we're approaching the eighth message here, this may be the most important message of every one, of any of them that I've shared with you. I want to talk to you today. This is important. I'll explain what this means, is how to pray someone out of Sodom. How to pray someone out of Sodom. Sodom is the place of bondage. From the, it's a, a place in the Old Testament. Sodom is the place of bondage. that has its grip on a loved one for many years. In this story, the man in bondage, his name is Lot. And the man that will help get hell's grip off of him is a praying man and a man of faith named Abraham. He will be the man who will talk to God about Lot. How to pray someone out of Sodom is really learning this. This is what it's learning, what we're we're teaching you to do. It's praying for people that will not pray for themselves. That's what we're going to begin to discover today. Listen to these words from Genesis 19, 29. But God had listened to Abraham's request. This is the prayer. And kept Lot safe by removing and rescuing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities, and those cities are Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot's future, don't miss this, church, Lot's future depended upon Abraham's prayer life. Now, that's weighty words, but I want you to hear that. Lot's future depended on Abraham's prayer life. Now, here's my big question. I I was challenged with this, so I'm going to challenge you today. Here it is. If someone's eternity depended on your prayer life, what kind of future would they be facing? Yeah, that's what I felt like. That person who said, "Woo!" that's what I felt like. When I, when I heard that, I was going like, Lord, I'm, uh, please help me to pray. Think, think about it just for a moment about another person in Acts chapter 12. Does Peter get released from jail if the church doesn't pray for him? This is the story in Acts 12, 5. Listen to it. So Peter was kept in the prison. Here comes the key. But prayer for him was being made fervently by the church to God. And on the very night when Herod was about to bring him forward, what that means is execution was about to happen. Peter was sleeping between two soldiers. I always pause there because if I know I'm about to die the next morning, I'm not sleeping soundly. How many are with me on that? This is a piece that passes understanding. In fact, as I finish reading, the angels have to poke him to wake him up. That's not me. Look at this now. He was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, guards in front of the door watching over the prison. And behold, an angel of the Lord suddenly appeared and a light shone in the cell. He had to strike Peter's side to wake him up, saying, get up quickly. His chains fell off his hands. And then Peter watched doors open up supernaturally. This is incredible. I had a big debate when I was doing some graduate work. I had a big debate with a theology professor um, on this passage. This man knew the theology of prayer, but not the experience of prayer. And my point was, Peter would not have been released if the church didn't pray. And I said, why would the Bible make a point of putting in this passage of the church praying fervently and and the angel coming if prayer didn't matter in this case. Because it seems that God connects Peter's chains falling off in his freedom with the church praying. That phrase, but prayer, is the turning point in the story. Listen to me for a moment. Never underestimate the power of a praying church. Never underestimate that. The great Puritan writer who I love so much, Thomas Watson, said this, the angel fetched Peter out of prison, but it was prayer that fetched the angel out of heaven. That's what it was. Prayer and deliverance are connected. Your prayers and people's freedom, I think, are intertwined. 
Because we're not talking about getting simply people out of prison. We're talking about praying that the grips of Sodom and Gomorrah would be pried off of them and that they would be set free. Let me ask you this question. How many know someone that needs to be set free from a bondage, an addiction, an atheism, drugs, pride, a cult? There's so much. I've talked to, I was, I was even talking with some of the baptismal people that were up there, talking to one precious sister who is the only, from one of our connect groups, who's the only Christian. She comes from a, um, a whole family of Muslims. And so from, so to hear her story, she's standing, the only one in her family that's getting water baptized and is only a believer. And she just goes, this message today, it helped me to believe that God can get a hold of my family. See, church, when prayer is missing in the church, so are decisions for Christ. Churches that don't have a prayer meeting won't see decisions because prayerless churches try to amuse and entertain the lost where it doesn't have the power of conviction to drive them to the cross. They just want to get them to the show on Sundays. And folks, in these days and times, we need more than just a show. We need the power of God again to touch people's lives. That's what we need. Some of you are wondering if it really works and if prayer can really set people free. And that's the story of Abraham and Lot. It's the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. The name of that city, Sodom and Gomorrah, brings with it an air and a reputation of wickedness and evil. Let me say it to you this way. It was the worst place on the planet to live. If you lived in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was nothing to boast about. You were living in the worst place. And Abraham, the father of faith in this praying man, had a family member, a nephew named Lot that was living in Sodom and Gomorrah. Let me just give you a little bit of an overview because of, of how important this is to understand. In Genesis 13, Abraham and Lot separate ways. Lot chooses to go into Sodom and Gomorrah. That's Genesis 13, 10. Now, that happens, just bear with me for a second, because there is significance to it. It happens in the year 2085 BC, approximately. But you're gonna understand why this is significant. And the Bible says that after, it's interesting to me that it says that after they separated, that Lot went towards Sodom and Gomorrah, that the Bible says that after Lot had separated, God spoke to Abraham in verse 14. And I kept looking at that, and I'm thinking to myself, sometimes you've got to get the voice of other people out of your life to get the voice of God back into your life. And it wasn't until he never heard Abraham never heard about, I'm going to multiply you as the sands of the, of, the, of, of the earth and the stars in the heavens until he separated from Lot. And I started to realize that there are sometimes God has to remove people from your life so you can hear from God again. The story picks up again as we leave Lot in Sodom and Gomorrah. Abraham has some incidences and some chapters in his life. Then the story picks up again with Abraham and Lot in Genesis 18 and 19. That's where our story begins. While Abraham is outside of his tent, three visitors show up. And one of those, two are angels, and one is a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. The Bible is clear about that. It's the Lord, the, the angel of the Lord. That happens, it happens in the Old Testament. When, when Nebuchadnezzar looks into the fiery furnace and say, I don't see Meshach, Shadrach, and Abednego, but I see a fourth one who looks like the Son of God. That was a pre-incarnate appearance of Jesus. These, heavenly, these three heavenly strangers show up to tell Abraham um, this news. He says that Sarah, your wife, is 90, you're 100, and get ready to start painting the room blue because you're going to be having a boy. So throw a shower. She's going to have a boy named Isaac. So to hear that as 90 and 100 years old, the Bible says that Sarah laughed. She was rebuked by that angel. But who knew, only God could have done it, that nine months later there'd be a little boy named Isaac that would come. And while they were leaving, it says in Genesis 18, 16, that Abraham was walking with them. And just before they were to walk out of sight, that third member of that trinity was going to go up into heaven and two were going to continue to walk to Sodom and Gomorrah. They turn around and they say, we cannot keep this a secret from Abraham. 
We need to tell him what we're getting ready to do. And the angel of the Lord looks at Abraham and says, we're on our way to Sodom and Gomorrah to destroy it. Listen to these words. In Genesis, 19, Genesis 18, 20, the cries of the victims in Sodom and Gomorrah are deafening. And the sin of those cities is immense. They're going to destroy it. And I don't know what it is, but I think Abraham then all of a sudden realizes, I have a relative that's living there. I have a, I have a nephew that I've walked with and journeyed with. When this happens, it is now 2067 BC. Here's the significance. For 18 years, Lot has immersed himself in the culture of Sodom and Gomorrah. Lot has been living there for almost two decades. And now Lot is about to be swept away with a destruction from heaven. He is not moving. He knows nothing of heaven's warning. And Lot is sitting with the Sodomites and has no idea Here's words that are associated with Sodom and Gomorrah. That fire and brimstone is on the way. That's where we get that phrase from. Genesis 19:24 It says that the Lord rained on Sodom and Gomorrah brimstone and fire from out of heaven. Then my question just becomes this. As I'm reading this, how do you get a relative? How do you get a loved one? How do you get Lot, who's been immersed in this culture and this place for 20 years, that is about to be destroyed. How do you get someone that you love out of the grips of Sodom? How do you get them out of that? That's what the story is. That's where I think this becomes the most important message I've preached. How do you get a person out of a place that is holding them captive? That literally you see what they can't see. You see that if they stay any longer, that it is going to be catastrophic for them. And you who love them are trying to figure out how do I begin just to do this. I have to pause for a second because I want to make this really, I want to make this real to you, but I want to show you the difference of this. This isn't the first time Abraham sees his nephew Lot in captivity or captured. He is brought in as a, as a, prisoner, of, a prisoner of war, POW. People come into Sodom and Gomorrah and they take they take Lot out, and the Bible says in Genesis 14, this is an important point here. So just for a moment, I want you to get this. In Genesis 14, Lot is taken as a prisoner of war, and what Abraham does is he takes 318 men. For some reason, the Bible was clear that that's so many men it took, 318 men, and go and rescue Lot out of that. Then the story later for all you Bible scholars, Melchizedek shows up and all that, but that's another point. But I want you to get this. In order to rescue Lot at this moment, it just took a bunch of guys to go in, rescue him, and pull him out. This one is different. Why wouldn't Abraham then say, we'll get the same 318 guys in Genesis 19 and let's pull him out of Sodom? Because this is different. Listen to me, folks. You're not pulling him from a place, you're pulling him from a spirit. You're pulling him from bondage. And folks, there are moments, don't miss this, there are moments you can send them to 318 counselors, 318 programs, put them on 318 different prescriptions, but the only thing that can pry them loose is the power of God and a praying person. It's the only thing that can get them loose. And some of you have tried 318 of everything and nothing has set them free. This message is for you. It's the message of the power of prayer when it seems to have gripped people's lives. And it says that God listened to Abraham's request and kept Lot safe, removing him from the disaster. God listened to Abraham's request not to Lot's prayer, but to Abraham's prayer because Lot didn't pray. Lot's deliverance, listen to this, was through Abraham's relationship with God. Lot wasn't praying, but we can pray for those people even when they don't pray for themselves. My heart was, it brought both joy and laughter. I was reading the story of a Philadelphia pastor who told about the time that he was speaking at a Pentecostal college here in the Northeast what was interesting was he was a Baptist pastor. He, didn't, he believed in the gifts of the Holy Spirit, but he's never experienced them before. And he said, so before the service, before he was going to preach to all these 
um, young people at this Pentecostal Bible college. He said eight men met him in the room, asked him to kneel down backstage so they could lay hands on his head to pray. He, Tony said, I, I'm glad to have prayer, but each of them prayed so long. And the longer they prayed, they kept pushing my head over. And he said, I felt like it was going to fall out. All these Pentecostals pushing on me. He says, and he said, even at times, it seemed that they started to wander in their prayer. He said, one guy started praying for some other guy and not me. Listen to what he said. He said, well, as they're all praying, some guy prayed, dear Lord. And now remember, Tony is the pastor that's supposed to preach. He goes, dear Lord, you know Charlie Stolfus. He lives in that silver trailer down the road one mile. You know the trailer, Lord, just down the road from the school on the right-hand side. And then Tony goes, I wanted to interrupt him and say, well, God knows where he lives. You should be praying for me. He says, what are you praying for him? He said, I got up tight. He said, and then the prayer went on. Lord, Charlie told me this morning that he was going to leave his wife and three kids. Step in and do something. Bring the family back together. Well, <laughs> Tony, had, Tony was just going, whatever. With that, the prayer time ended. They went to preach the college chapel. Things went well. And he got in his car to make the hour drive home. And as he began to drive home on the Pennsylvania Turnpike, Tony says he saw, saw a hitchhiker and felt compelled to pick him up. The visiting pastor said, we drove a few minutes. And I said, hi, my name is Pastor so-and-so. What's yours? He goes, my name is Charlie Stolfus. <laughs> Listen to this. He said, I couldn't believe it. He said, as soon as he told me that, I got off the turnpike, turned around, and headed back towards the school. Charlie said, hey, mister, where are you taking me? I said, I'm taking you home. He said, he's not his arrows. He said, his, he narrowed his eyes and asked, why? He said, because you just left your wife and three kids. He goes, he says, yeah, that's right. And then he said he, he plastered himself against the driver's side because he didn't want to be close to me. And he goes, he said, as they're driving, he couldn't believe it. He goes, with that shock written all over his face, he, he then said, as he drove, I drove right to the silver trailer one mile from the school, pulled up, and he goes, how did you know I lived here? He said, God told me. And he said, I totally believe God did through the guy that wasn't praying for me at the prayer meeting. <laughs> he said, we got there, the trailer door opened up, his wife came out and says, you're back, you're back. He said, he walked up, whispered in her ear, and the more he talked with her, the bigger her eyes got as they were both staring at me. Then I walked up with, said with real authority, the two of you sit down. I'm going to talk to you too, and you're going to listen. And he goes, man, did they listen. That afternoon, I led two young people to Jesus Christ in a silver trailer. <laughs> get, get this. Don't miss this. It was the great J. Sidlow Baxter from Australia who said these words. He said, men may reject our appeals, refuse our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they're helpless against our prayers. Okay, Listen. Get your phones out and take a picture. Tweet something good for once. Put that up there. Take a picture of that. Keep that up there. Men may reject our appeals, refuse our message, oppose our arguments, despise our persons, but they are helpless against our prayers. That's why for the next few moments, I want to talk to you about the depths of the sin of Sodom and the power of prayer. I want to talk to you how to pray someone out of Sodom, but I really want to show you the grip, you're going to have to see the grip on Lot for a few moments so you can see that if the pr a praying man can unhinge him from 20 years being in Sodom and Gomorrah, then God can do a work for my spouse, for my son, for my daughter. Lot is the one who must be prayed for. Abraham is the one who must pray. So let's talk about Lot for a second. What does a person who is stuck and in Sodom look like? What, it, what, it, what is it? And I want you to see the depths of what begins to happen. I want you to see the chains and the depths of deception in, in Sodom. Because if you can see the depth, you could see the power. Lot chooses Sodom in Genesis 13. And now he is a resident 
And this is what he looks like. Number one, Lot is sitting in the gates of Sodom. That's when the angels show up. They see him in Genesis 19.1 that Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom. That's a big deal. To sit in the gate means that you're not just sitting at the entrance of the city. You are in government. You are in leadership. That's what that word means. All the decisions of a city were decided by the elders at the gates of the city, which means conviction has worn off Lot, and now his friends are now the people of Sodom. I want you to understand something. I'm just going to take a stab at this, and then I'm going to back off because it's probably deeper than I want to go into today. We have to be careful of distinguishing with people we work with, people we live next to, people we have coffee with. There is a difference between fellowship and ministry. The Bible says we don't, light cannot have fellowship with darkness, which means there's nothing in common. Folks, when I'm hanging out with unsaved people, I'm not going like, hey, we're bros. I'm thinking of ways to minister to them. I, but if I don't, then they influence me. Does this, does this make sense? I don't have time, but there is important. There's a difference between ministry and fellowship. Number two, Lot is not adverse to spiritual things. He's not an angry, he's not an angry spiritual man. I mean, not an angry man towards, towards things of heaven. Listen to this. Now the two angels came to Sodom that evening while he was sitting at the gate. And when Lot saw him, he rose to meet them, bowed down. He even invited him to his home. He doesn't curse out the angels or run away. He welcomes them. This person does not hate God, will even talk about church, will even come to church when it's convenient. But this convenience is, is not a compliment, but it's dangerous spirituality. Listen to me carefully, because some of you may be sitting in this place or listening online. This is a person that will come to church but never leave Sodom. They will welcome even a sermon but never leave Sodom. They are religious enough to talk about God but not religious enough to make a commitment to God. But folks, and here's the part I want you to get. Listen, listen. This is why we need praying churches today. This person, lots, the person that are in bondage, they don't need a church service. They need an encounter with God. They don't need another church service. They need an encounter with the living God. They can do church services and leave unscathed. They can leave church, they can leave this building and go back to living with their boyfriend because they get unscathed. That's the part that God has to pry our fingers off of. The third thing is that they've lost all authority when they speak about Bible or godly things. There's no authority. It's just words when they speak about it. Think about this for a moment. Lot is about to tell his children of judgment that's coming. And I want you to see what their reaction is. So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-law who are pledged to marry his daughters. And he said, hurry, get out of this place because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But look at this. But his son's-in-law thought he was joking. There's no authority there. You can bring up Bible verses. You can talk about it. You can debate with me. But there's no authority. It's just knowledge. There's no conviction. His sons-in-law hear, hear him speak truth, but it seems to be joking. Fourthly, he has impaired judgment. This is the part that is just so full of deception. The Bible says that before they had gone to bed, all the men from any part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot and they said, where are the men, they, they didn't, those angels who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can rape them or have sex with them. And look what Lot says. Lot went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him and said, no, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. That's good. But what comes next is, is unimaginable. He says, don't touch these men. But look, I have two daughters who've never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do whatever you like to them. Folks, come on. Look at the deception and the, and the degradation of this man's soul. And somehow he just says it with such ease. Don't touch the angels, but you can have my daughters. But don't do anything to these men, for they've come under the protection of my roof. All I kept thinking to myself is, is you're offering your daughters to be raped. 
where just a moment ago you're talking to angels and now you're, you're beginning to offer your daughters. And then I thought to myself, who has three daughters in my life? I kept thinking, did even his daughters hear that? Did his daughters hear what, his, what their own father said about them? And finally, Lot has no sense of impending danger. Look at the exchange between Lot and the angels when the, when the firestorm is starting from heaven. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, Hurry, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And then when he hesitated, the men grasped his hand and the hands of his wife and the two daughters and led them safely outside the city, for the Lord was merciful. Folks, I kept thinking to myself, how much more do you need to make the right decision here? You're, you, you have to be told by angels to hurry up. Then, then you're hesitating. they got to grab your hands of your entire... Like, how, how deep is this deception? And look, it even goes on further. As soon as they have brought them out, he said, flee for your lives. Don't look back. And we know that Lot's wife does. And don't stop anywhere in the plain. Flee to the mountains, for you'll be swept away. And then look at Lot. But Lot says, no, my lords, please. I wanted to go, Lot, when, when does it register to you? They're shouting to him to flee. They have to grab his hands. And now Lot is arguing with angels. Incredible to me. A plane crashed into the mountains of Columbia some years ago. American Airlines flight 965 into the mountains killing all 151 passengers and the eight-man crew. It was returning to Columbia for the Christmas holidays. But it was during a storm. The weather hid the mountain, but the GPW, the ground proximity warning system, kept warning the pilots, terrain, terrain, pull up, pull up, pull up. And because they, they looked outside and they looked at their altitude and the flight recorder, they realized we've done this before, we know where we're at, we're okay, we can handle this even though there's a storm that's here. And when they looked and listened to the black box that they found in the mountains of the Columbia, the Columbia Hills, they heard the last three words that were spoken were this, shut up, gringo. It was the final words. Basically, we got this. I don't need to hear you. And 12 seconds later, it ran into the side of a mountain. The warning system saw what they didn't see and were too distracted to see. That's the prayer. That's the heart of Abraham going, I see what you don't see. Angels see what you don't see. Heaven sees what you don't see. And now the only thing is we don't need, we, conversations don't seem to work. Texting, emails, pleas, tears don't seem to work. And folks, the only thing that will work to unhinge a heart that is so, that is so, just, just it, it into the immersed into Sodom is a praying mom, a praying dad, a praying friend. And right before Abraham prays this prayer to get him out, because the Bible gives us the prayer that he prays. The angels, remember, they turn from Abraham. You're going to have a baby to Sarah and Abraham. Then turn, and then this, this powerful Interaction happens in Genesis 18, 22, as we talk about Abraham and close. The Bible says that the men were setting out for Sodom. I just love this, the way that the message says it. But Abraham stood in God's path, blocking his way and saying, I've got to ask you, I've got to pray. And, and no, folks, here's what I want you to get. What's about to come next from verses 23 through 33. I want you to get this. It's Abraham's prayer is the Bible's first recorded prayer. And without reading the whole thing, it's when he's talking to God and saying, if there's 50 righteous men, would you show mercy? If there's 40 righteous men, would you show mercy? If there's 30, would you show mercy? And he keeps, he keeps pleading with God not to destroy Sodom if he finds any righteous people. But I have to think that, he, that Abraham is thinking of one name amongst all the numbers that he gives to God. And that is his nephew, Lot. Let me finish with this. Let me talk to you about Abraham, the man who must pray. Because prayer is the only thing that can fight against the depths of sin and deception. 
I'm so thankful for our general overseer, Pastor Carter Conlin, and our team at Summit, our Bible school. In 40 degree weather and rain that still was hitting up in Connecticut, 300 people gathered last night at Yale University to pray that God would work a miracle there. Because folks, there's just certain times that it's not, it's not, listen, I studied apologetics. It's not, it's not coming up with another argument. It's not coming up with a reasonable argument. Some of these things need just people to pray, to seek the face of God. Listen, let me just fill in the blank and close. Listen to this. Abraham got up early that morning and hurried out to the place where he had stood in the Lord's presence. Don't miss that spot because he's talking about where he goes to pray, where he had stood. It, talk, it talks about a habit. It's a habit, a habit that he has. He looked out across the plain towards Sodom and Gomorrah, watched as columns of smoke rose from the cities like smoke from a furnace. And then the verse we read, but God listened to Abraham's request, kept Lot safe removing him from the disaster that engulfed the cities and the plain. Let me just say this as our musicians get ready to come. Abraham did not wait for smoke to pray. He didn't wait until things were going horrible. Oh, we better pray. He started praying way before Sodom and Gomorrah took place. I have to believe this was in 18 years of praying. I have to believe this was Abraham praying and praying that he went where, where he stood before. Where he stood implies he's been praying. And this is what I believe. Every morning, listen mom, listen dad, listen roommate, spouse. I, I, I see prayer like this. That as we pray, it's like taking a sledgehammer to hard hearts. And every morning we pray, it's like, and Cindy and I have a list of backsliders and people that we're praying that come to faith in Christ. And folks, there are some names on our list that have been there for years. But I have to believe this. As we pray for them every night, it's like a sledgehammer that comes every single time. You know what I see it as, folks? This is the image I see. It's like a man that's sitting on the, uh, that sees concrete and goes, we got to break this up because we're going to put down, we're going to pour new cement. And they're taking, I've watched it on the streets of New York. They're taking that sledgehammer. And what if it takes 35 strikes before, the, before it cracks. Was it the 35th that was the most important? No, they all count. Every one of them was loosening it up for that, for that crack to begin to take place. That's what I believe. I believe for 18 years, Abraham is going, oh God, get him out. Oh God, get him out. Oh God, get him out. And all of a sudden, when angels show up in Sodom, the crack came that day. God started to do something. Folks, let me tell you how it starts. Last week, one of our Connect Group leaders shared with our team that she and her husband have been inviting and praying for four years for a neighbor to attend church. What does that mean? That's the, that's the sledgehammer. It just keeps coming and coming and coming. And she said last Monday, she asked a group to pray, her Connect Group to pray on Tuesday. And they said she asked again, and again, and again, what she said was, she goes, I wanted to get some help in swinging the sledgehammer. And she said this, and they, they, she said, then they asked their neighbor to come to church. They said yes, and two Sundays ago, they got born again during the service, is what God did. When you mention a name, listen to me, I think when you get specific, you see answers clearer. When you go, God, save them. Just be specific. Folks, can we, can we do something here? Can we just, till now to the end of the year, how about we pray, we pick one person, and every day we just come. God, I'm back here again. Save them, save them, save them, save them, save them. Can we just, how many would say, I'm going to try to do this every day to the end of the year. I'm going to get sledgehammer prayers. I don't know. I just made that up. Sledgehammer prayers that just keep coming. God, that you're going to save them. Just, just one sentence. God, get them out of Sodom. God, save them this week. Always respond to that impulse to pray. What was amazing was when the smoke went up and he saw the smoke, he didn't mess them up. It didn't bring doubt. Abraham knew this. God's got this. God remembered Abraham and got him out of Sodom. We just pray, we let God figure out the rescue plan. 
God took the prayers of Abraham, sent an angel with a strong grip and a relentless voice and pulled him out of Sodom. A man that never thought about praying about himself. A man that was sinking deeper and deeper, sitting in a gate. Instead of ministry, he was involved with fellowship with Sodomites. And for 18 years, didn't realize that chains were going upon him. And we've got friends and family. We've got loved ones. That maybe for some of you, they've been longer than 18 years involved with that. And prayer is our only recourse. It's to pray when they won't even pray for themselves. It's learning to pray someone out of Sodom. It's learning to realize that 318 people that Abraham used to rescue him the first time, it's going to take not 318 people, but just one woman of faith that's going to get on her knees and say every day, God, get them out. God, get them out. Prayer is not only our only recourse. Prayer is the only thing that can work. Let me finish with this as we close. I want to tell you this story. I'm reading a book that's just um, that I took with me. We took Cindy and I took three days off two weeks ago, right after Easter. And I'm reading, and I grabbed this book. I had no intentions of grabbing it. And two things happened to me: an excitement and an embarrassment happened both at the same time. An excitement happened. Have you ever read a book and going, "This is what I was supposed to read. This is the book." And it all of a sudden it filled my spirit. But I'm embarrassed because. It's a book I felt I should have read before, and I just, I just didn't. Many of you know that the story of this church is here, and the story is written, it all starts with a book called The Cross and the Switchblade by David Wilkins. That's not the book I'm talking about, because some of you are going like, your dad's in that book, and you haven't, okay, just let's all relax, okay? I've read that book, okay? Um, and let me just say something. How, how many, that, okay, this is not condemnation, but this is kind of, I'm excited to do, for us to do this. How many have never read The Cross on Switchblade? Would you just raise your hand? Hold it up high. You don't have to be embarrassed. Wow, same thing in the last service. Let me tell you what we're going to do this summer. We're going to take a Sunday night and show the movie The Cross on the Switchblade here. Is we're going to show it on the big screen. And I'm telling you, it, it's the book that I'm talking about that I didn't even, I, I knew it existed, but I forgot is the book, it's called Beyond the Cross and the Switchblade. It's the next chapter of what God did through Dave and Gwen Wilkerson. It is so real, it's so raw of just the, 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 what Brother Dave went through after the miracles of Nikki Cruz getting saved. If you, don't, if you don't know the story, I have to just give you this one backstory. David Wilkerson, when he was in Pennsylvania, gave up his evenings, got rid of his TV, and gave up his, gave up his TV watching in the evening so he could pray. He had a Life magazine in front of him and saw on the front cover um, seven young men that beat up from a gang, the, dr the dragons that beat up Michael Farmer, a quadriplegic in the park. I couldn't remember if it was Central Park. Beat a kid up mercilessly, mercilessly and were being tried for murder. And David Wilkerson saw that. He felt the Holy Spirit say, you have to go to New York. You have to go to New York and minister to these kids. He walked into the, the, into the courtroom. They wouldn't even let him get in. They brought him out and made a joke of him. And he said, what is that in your hand? He goes, well, it's a Bible. They said, hold it up. He holds up a Bible. They take a picture of him and it's plastered all over the front page of the New York newspapers. All the gangs saw it and they go, that guy's on our side. So they looked at the picture of David Wilkerson, this skinny preacher holding up a Bible, which opened up the doors for him to talk to all the gangs. Thus, Nikki Cruz, Israel coming to Jesus, Teen Challenge starting, which has rescued tens of thousands of people from all over the world. There's a, over a thousand centers all over the world because of a man's obedience. But here's what's amazing. I'm reading the story of a struggle that David Wilkerson has, and I want to read it to you in regards to prayer. He said, in those years after I came to New York as what as the, the papers called me, the skinny country preacher, he said, I was trying to reach the boys accused of murdering Michael Farmer. But there's one thing that puzzled me in all my prayers. I'd never been allowed to minister to the boys on trial. I said, why, Lord? Why did you have me come all the way to New York for all these boys and stop me when I was supposed to talk? He said, I asked God that question hundreds of times. I'm so grateful that God did the work with Nikki Cruz. I'm so grateful that God did the work 
14 challenge. But he said, but I'm just wondering why, why wouldn't you let me talk to the boys that were charged with murder? And he said, why Lord, couldn't I not see the ringleader of it all? Kind of the Nikki Cruz of the gang, Juan Martinez, Juan Martinez. He said of the seven boys brought to trial for beating Michael Farmer to death, three were released, four were given sentences from 20 years to life. I tried to get permission from the court to visit the jail boys, but I could not obtain what prison they were in, much less their home addresses to minister to their family. The name of one special boy, Juan Martinez, kept coming to my my prayer time. I kept going, God, how do I see him? So David Wilkerson, now you have to remember, instead of choosing prayer, because this is where he talks about, this is so, this is so good. He said, instead of praying, he said, I chose Now you have to think about this. The boy he's trying to see in New York City is Juan Martinez. So he said, I thought this, I'll just go to the phone book and look up Juan Martinez. Are you out of your mind? Martinez and Juan, New York City? Come on, Brother Dave, you you can do better than that. This is what he said. It was so great when I read this. He goes, when I looked up all the Juan Martinez's in New York City, Okay, this is going to be, this is a little dated. He goes this. He said, after I deposited my 40th dime, how many know it used to be a dime to make a phone call? Okay, just want to, how many remember using a dime to make a phone call? Okay, this is an older group. So this is, so makes, he says, 40 dimes are gone. He says, so I, and, and every time I call, Juan Martinez, they well, of course, Juan Martinez, but it's not the Juan from the trial. He said, then I did. Here's the part I want you to hear. Then I did what I should have done in the first place. I bowed my head and prayed. I'm sitting in my car and I said, Lord, I give up. I've reached the limits of my own ideas. Lead me where I must go for I don't even know what to do next for this young man. He said, and then suddenly, incredibly after that, the Lord said, stop your car and get out right now and ask for Juan Martinez. <laughs> David Wilkerson said he stops the car. He comes out. I don't, it didn't even say where he was. It must have been Brooklyn. He comes out and just goes, does anybody know Juan Martinez? And the people there go, he lives right here. He goes in, meets the parents of the kid he's been trying to see. I, he said, I parked in front of the building where the Martinez family lived. Now, listen to this. This is how the story ends. I learned that Juan was in Elmira prison in upstate New York. I tried to make contact with him through the Martinez family. He even had permission at one time, but then they revoked the permission. At every turn, I was being blocked. I just said, well, God, maybe you don't want to, but I'm going to still pray. And still, he said this, after years had passed, years, I never let go of my wish to see Juan, but I would pray for him regularly. Then one day an invitation came from a prison. This time it was from Auburn State Correctional Institution in Auburn, New York. Their chaplain wrote that shortly after the appointment that he started passing out copies of the cross and the switchblade. The inmates, he said, accepted them. And he says they were so excited to read the book, The Cross and the Switchblade. He said that day 150 inmates showed up. I preached a simple message. We sang a couple simple songs. I gave an invitation. And I asked the the fellows who responded to meet me in the chaplain's office. Among the prisoners came was a studious looking heavy set young man. He had a pleasant smile and a dimple on each side of his cheeks. And he said, Mr. Wilkerson, I've been waiting for years to meet you. I'm Juan Martinez. He said, I threw my arms around him and I said, Juan, I've been waiting to meet you too. (laughs) Then he told me how he found a copy of the cross on a switchblade and how it meant a lot to him. He said, I got a favor to ask you, Mr. Wilkerson. Would you pray for me so I can change? He said, it had been my dream. I pulled Juan aside and I said, Juan, just repeat this prayer. It's really simple. Just tell Jesus you believe that he's the son of God, that you're a sinner and you'd like to turn your life I said, would you want to do that right now, Juan? He said, yes. He lowered his eyes, repeated the prayer. When he looked up, his eyes were gleaming. And he looked at Juan. Brother Dave said, it's the start of a new day, Juan. From now on, nothing else is going to be the same. Folks, that 
starts when you put the dimes back in your pocket and you get down on your knees and go, God, only you can make this work out. If you've got somebody that needs to be set free, a name that comes to your mind right now, stand to your feet right now, quickly. Just stand to your feet. If you're going, I got a name, they are in Sodom. They may be with you right now. Don't look at them. Just look straight ahead. Just look straight ahead. Because I got, I'll have a word for them in a second. But I want to bring that person who is stuck in Sodom before the throne of God. I want you to become Abraham. I want you to begin to choose to become Abraham from this point on that you said, I'm just going to come. I'm going to come every single day. I'm not going to wait for smoke. I'm not going to wait for smoke to rise. The moment I'm seeing a little shift of their love for God, of not wanting to be in the presence of God, that I'm going right to prayer. Some of you said the smoke is going, the fire is there, brimstone is coming, and I need a miracle. God can do it. God can work this out. God can work this out. The bondage could be atheism. The bondage could be deception. It could be drugs, a cult. It could be a sexual lifestyle that they've chosen. It could be any one of those things. But I have to tell you this. They may, they may, they may reject your appeals, refuse your phone calls, won't answer your texts, but they are helpless against your prayers. Only God can come in. Whether it's your Lot, your Juan, or your Charlie Stolfus, who knows who it is? You know the names, and you know who you're praying for. Can we begin to pray for them right now? Come on. I want to turn this place into just, this is going to become Abraham's prayer meeting right now. Come on, lift those hands right now as we start to pray for them. Father, I stand with them. I've got names that I've been praying for, Father, for literally years and years and years. And Father, I'm, I'm, I'm worried because some of them seem to go deeper and deeper into atheism, agnosticism. Some are going deeper and deeper, oh God, into addictions. But God, I have to believe that as we stand in the gap, you gave us this story of Abraham and Lot. 18 years in bondage. And you would rescue him right now, Lord God. So Father, I'm believing for a miracle. A miracle. These hands raised. Father, these represent tears and pain. It represents some of, some, some of them have sleepless nights. But oh God, we're going to believe for a miracle all over this place, all over, the, all over, Father, the world that have their hands raised in homes and in kitchens and in living rooms. Those are raising a hand right now as they're watching on a phone in an airport or in a subway. They're watching, oh God, or even listening right now in a car. We are praying for that son, daughter, granddaughter. We're praying for that friend, the roommate, the spouse. And we're saying to Sodom, we're saying to hell, let them go in Jesus' name. We're praying for the crack in the concrete. We're praying, send the angels while Lot is sitting in the gate. Some of them are sitting in a bar, sitting in a club, sitting on a boyfriend's couch, sitting, oh God, in, in their dorm room, sitting in a frat house. Set them free. Send angels right now. Send angels right now to set them free. Oh God, work it out right now. Now, folks, look at me as we close. Look at me for a moment. Can I just tell you the end of the story? You can read it for yourself. It's all found in 1 Peter chapter 2. Let me tell you the end of the story. Three times in 1 Peter chapter 2, Peter somehow sees the end of Lot and calls him three times. You ready for this? Righteous Lot. How in the world can God do that? He's God. He can take... He can take a sodomite and make them righteous. A man sitting in the gate, he calls him. Listen, not my words. I'm, I'd be calling, I'm going like, that's, that's, you know, dumb lot, unwise lot, <laughs> messed up lot. And, but when God gets a hold of you, it could become righteous lot is what it can become. The story can be changed just like that. So here's how we're ending. Can I just tell you, some of you may be sitting here in the balcony, standing up here. Maybe you're all the way in the back of the balcony so no one knows you're here. Or in the back of the church. Maybe you wouldn't even come to church, but somehow you're watching online. You may be here today because you're the answer to somebody's prayer. You may be sitting in this place and you're going, and you're going, I'm coming only because they had, and all of a sudden, you don't even realize you're part of someone's four, five, seven year prayer. And now you're sitting, and today, God can turn the chapter and change your life right now. He can just change you right now. Pastor, 
Pastor Tim, how could that happen? Folks, you've got praying people that are here. And right now, God can come and change you from the inside out. How does that happen? That's why I love the words that Jesus uses in John 3 about being born again. You know what that means? You get another chance. That's what born again is. Folks, you're looking at somebody. I know, I'm so God gives second chances. How many know about a second chance? How many know about a tenth chance? Anybody here a hundredth chance? Boy, more hands on that one than the other ones. You're going like, okay. God, get, God is the one who calls us back and gives us another chance, another chance. And that can happen today. You may be the answer to someone's prayer. And you're sitting here today and God can change you from the inside out. How does that happen, Pastor Tim? You first start and go, I'm a sinner. I can't do it. I'm broken on the inside. I can't fix myself. There's no way I can do it. It seems the more I'm getting fixed, the chains keep holding on. That's why God sent his son 2,000 years ago, admitting I'm a sinner, believing that God sent his son 2,000 years ago to die in my place so I can have a second chance. I don't get to heaven by my own good works. I get to heaven by the work of Christ on the cross. He, because of his work, it'd be foolish to say, think how foolish this is. Jesus comes and dies and says, do your best. And you're going like, my best, I'm still in bondage. I can't even do it. But by saying, God, I believe that you sent your son for me. And I want to make you Lord of my life. Let God change you from the inside out. He can change you right now, right now. If you're here today, listen, if you're here today, I want you to join all those that made the decision in the first service. If you're here today, I want to pray a prayer, just a born again prayer that says, God, I, please help me. I want out of this. I want, to see, I want to see a new life. If you're here today and say, Tim, I want, I want God to come in and change me from the inside out. I don't need religion. I need Jesus. I need Jesus. I don't need Times Square Church. I need Jesus. Tim, when you pray that prayer, I'm a little nervous because I'm not perfect. Ooh, that's good news. Perfect people don't go to heaven. Forgiven people go to heaven. That's the good news. If you're here today and say, Pastor Tim, would you, when you pray that born again prayer that gives me a new start, I need that today. You can keep your head, heads up, eyes open. There, she's already going right over there. If, you, if that's you, hold your hand up as high as you can. Say, put me in that prayer today. I want God to do that. Hold it up as high as you can. Yes, 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 yes. All the whole bunch of the middle rows, just all back there. Yes, 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 yes. All the way over there. Balcony, got you. That whole row right there. All the way in the back, got you. All of that. Folks, there has to be some like 40 hands that have gone up to say, God, come in and change. Can we pray this together? Come on. Let's say this out loud. Dear Lord Jesus, I believe you're the son of God. I believe that on the cross, you took my sin, my shame, and my guilt, and you died for it. You faced hell for me so I wouldn't have to go. You rose from the dead to give me a place in heaven a purpose on earth, and a relationship with your Father. Today, Lord Jesus, I turn from my sin to be born again. Come on, now say this with me. God is my Father. Jesus is my Savior. The Holy Spirit is my helper. And heaven is my home. In Jesus' name, and everybody said amen and amen.